Welcome everyone to AZ Bio Peers. Um, as you know, our AZ Bio Peers stands for Professional Education, Engagement, and Resource Sharing. And we're thrilled to have one of our leading CEOs and representatives from our economic development teams in both um, Central and Southern Arizona joining us today to talk about the importance of attracting companies and talent to Arizona. So um, they're going to share the ins and outs of that, but I'm going to turn it over to our moderator of the day, Dr. Steve Potts of Oncomix Therapeutics. And Steve, the platform is yours. Oh, great. Well, good morning, everybody. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, I'm, uh, it's really a pleasure to moderate this. And it's a topic kind of dear to my heart. Um, I think it's one that's easy to talk about and hard to execute on, like, like so many things. Um, you know, just a little background on me, and then I'll let the uh, camera and David introduce themselves. Um, I think that's how we'll, we'll start. And then, and then I met each of you, you have some nice presentations as well, I think, to talk to. So just um, brief on my background. Um, I'm a serial entrepreneur, kind of guilty as charged. Um, I've been involved in three consecutive exits. Um, let's see. One of those was in Arizona and two were in San Diego, uh, which kind of probably reflects some of the theme of the companies I've, I seem to be building have pull people from San Diego, pull, pull money from San Diego, but are intended to be located here as much as I can. Um, I'm a PhD out of MC Davis, originally an MBA back in the late 90s. Uh, I've been in cancer drug development and diagnostics for about two decades. Um, and I think this is probably a good thing to make a point of. My two life sciences, I think of it as kind of three areas. Um, and, and there, there are more than this, of course, but I, just in terms of commercial side life sciences, there's diagnostics, medical device, and then drug development. And I represent two of those. Um, I spent about 10 years in diagnostics, uh, cancer diagnostics. Um, and then about the last 10 years in drug development. I've done a little bit in, in devices, but not that much, not enough to, to really have any significance. So I think I'm pretty, um, I think I understand two of the, the three, three kind of legs of the, of the life sciences tool from a commercial side. Um, currently, I think my uh, focus has been entirely on, on uh, drug development. So my lens when I think of hiring is really that aspect. How do we get more biotech? and pharma experience drug development happening here in town? How do we recruit people uh, here from other places that have that kind of experience? Uh, I'm currently CEO of a company called Oncomix. We, we raised a $25 million Series A about two years ago. Um, I'm out pitching. Normally, I would be out actually traveling, but I'm out pitching um, on, the, on a gajillion Zoom calls right now for a Series B. It's just a Series B crossover, about a $50 to $100 million Series, series B, um, and we're raising kind of uh, both in Asia um, and in the U.S. So lots of calls with New York and lots of calls with San Francisco um, and then some with Asia. Um, it is nice to actually not be on the road doing it. It's kind of a nice perk. Um, so that we've got about 15 employees in downtown Phoenix. Um, I do have um, two, two, and two of my executive team is in San Diego and two are in the Bay Area and my medical office is in Montana. Um, so I would have tried to do kind of some some my view of the company is basically put as many people as I can here in Arizona and try to get people to move here. Um, but I do have a C-suite that they're kind of end of one people. I, I have a virus we're developing to cure cancer and so those kinds of people are pretty rare in any city. And so they tend to, some of them are kind of staying where they are, um, but we are hubs here. And before Zoom, we would basically be here Monday, Tuesday, and then people would go back. Work really well, um, and, and working well too, but we're just doing less travel uh, with, the, with the teams that are not here in Phoenix. Uh, we're moving into the Wexford building, which is amazing. That is just an awesome place. Um, and I think really can't overemphasize how unique it is to have a building like that that's 10 minutes from the airport. Um, there are certainly, Boston has some great buildings. Um, San Diego has lots of great buildings, so does San Francisco, but nobody has these kinds of life science buildings 10 minutes from an airport with, with direct flights you know, everywhere in the country. So it's a, that's a huge advantage and it works really well operationally. Um, so anyway, that's a, a little a long background on me. Uh, maybe David, or maybe Cameron, you want to go next, and then David, just to kind of give your your bio, and then we'll then we'll come back to you for uh, um, some presentations on this topic. Sure, that's great. Thanks, David. It's so exciting to hear from you um, about your move into Wexford and 
you know, that's certainly been an anchor to the Phoenix Biomedical Campus and we're all thrilled for you. So congratulations. Uh, okay. And <laughs> it's nice to meet everybody this morning. Uh, good to see you all. My name is Cameron Robb. I'm the Vice President of Business Development with the Greater Phoenix Economic Council. I've been with that group for about two years, loving it. Uh, very mission-driven, uh, um, you know, quality organization. Prior to that, I had 17-year uh, career in higher ed. And so came from five years at ASU, and I was in the business of talent. So I was in career services on the employer relations side and helping to find all of the hiring organizations, essentially, to take up our talent, all the interns, MBAs, alumni, every, everything in between. So that's how I was connected with ASU, because I was on that labor force side, or sorry, with GPEC. And uh, so when I found my in at GPEC, I took it, and uh, not looking back. <laughs> Native Phoenician, born and raised here. Uh, this is my hometown and I love it. Look forward to uh, the discussion this morning. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate it. It's great to have the call. And GPEC has been really fantastic um, over the years. I mean, you guys have been at this for not just in, not just in my sciences, but just more broadly. So thank you for the service of the whole organization. Uh, David? Good morning, Steve. Thanks uh, for the opportunity. Good to see Joan. And we've been, I've been working with Joan for Many years, um, and uh, uh, currently with uh, Sun Corridor, I'm the executive vice president. I oversee the business development uh, section of that organization, um, amongst other things that get assigned. I've been with them, uh, I can't believe I'm saying this, but almost 15 years now. Um, I can't believe that we've been in existence for, well, not as long as GPEC, but for us, what seems like a blink, but is actually, I think, coming up on 16 years. So. Um, I was like the fourth employee that they that they hired there. So uh, my background came out of Portland, uh, did this kind of work up there for a number of years. I've been at this for, I won't even say how long, given that Cameron introduced herself, and I don't want to say how long I've been doing it. Um, and uh, we handle, I'll get into it in my organization, but um, we've got a small team down there of about 10 now, and we cover the relocation and and uh, recruitment, uh, retention side of things for Southern Arizona. David, thank you. And thank you for your service as well. We look forward to hearing more a little bit later in the, in the meeting. Um, let's come back to Cameron, maybe. Can you just give us a, um, I think you, you can share your screen and give us some kind of thoughts in terms of how you're approaching life science as well as in retention. I can just see the lens on the top. So yeah, I mean, a little bit about GPEC for those of you who may not already know, and as you know, David referenced, we've been around for you know over 30 years now. And you know, this is, you can go to the next slide, thank you. Uh, and even the next after that. <laughs> we are, um, we're a mission-driven organization and we basically, you know, take a data-centric approach to the work that we do in trying to attract and grow quality business. So we really center our efforts around advocating for the region's competitiveness, but we certainly don't do this alone. Uh, I see a lot of partners on this call. And, uh, and so what you can see is over the years, you know, we've brought in, and by now it's probably closer to over 900 organizations uh, with over $20 billion of capital investment and economic impact. And right now we're probably tracking about 50 new companies a year. So, you know, when we do this, we do it in partnership. And so we're 22 cities and towns and all of Maricopa County. And that is what helps us create an attraction uh, to the region by working with all of the economic development directors at each locality. Uh, and we also partner with the state. Uh, and so that's how we're able to achieve some of these stats uh, in growing the economy. Next slide. So just to touch a little bit on our services, because, you know, again, if, if you haven't worked with us in this capacity uh, and didn't realize that we had this full suite of services, but perhaps you're working with companies who are trying to grow and scale in the marketplace, one of the things that we like to do is rely on the data science, like I said. And so that means that we can create, you know, customized operating cost comparisons. We know that many people, uh, when they're looking at relocating or expanding their business, labor and cost tend to be at the top. So we can definitely address those things with, you know, labor market comparison data uh, and um, 
obviously anything that comes to taxes and incentives and, you know, um, you know, some of the connectivity to the key resources. I think about some of the friends who are on this call. We work with the uh, Claudia at the City of Phoenix on a regular basis. We work with the Flynn Foundation. You know, Joan at AZ Bio has certainly been a rock for us. We've got a lot of bioscience health tech companies that are looking to level up. And certainly through Joan's efforts with White Hat and, and everything else, those are the types of things that when companies contact us to help them, you know, we're providing those resources and those connections. So we take it from, you know, the very first phone call all the way to the ribbon cutting and, and we can be helpful with public relations and everything else. But a large part of what we do is the actual site selection. So we work with a network of local brokers, uh, national site selectors, you know, even some direct corporate contacts and so forth just to try to help people find a place here. Next slide. So if you advance, what we're gonna get into is, you know, what's the most exciting thing that I think we've seen in decades? And, you know, uh, Flynn can back us up because of all of the research and work that they've been doing for so many years. But I think this might be uh, one of the more exciting times that we've witnessed with over $3 billion of capital investment, you know, being infused into the market. And over 4.5, I thought I heard Chris Mackey say 4.7 uh, million square feet of new uh, facilities under construction right now, which will create over 7,000 new jobs. And a lot of these successes are homegrown. You know, of course, we have Banner and, you know, we have Honor Health and Dignity and Mayo, and we've seen so many of these providers grow and scale here. And then that creates you know, a more attraction for everybody external to the market because they get excited about what's going on. Obviously, Uncle Mix is a perfect example of seeing how somebody can raise funds in a couple of years and move and scale to the level that now is making headlines. Next slide. So essentially, and some people might not realize this, probably everybody on this call does, um, but there are times that I'm speaking with prospective uh, clients or, or prospects they don't realize that healthcare is the largest industry in Arizona. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it represents almost 13% of total jobs. And, and, you know, we're at this point over 4,000, or excuse me, 4% uh, in, in growth year over year. So you can see some of the anchor uh, organizations that we get to brag about at GPEC, which is something that's very fun for me to do. But what I have to say is, you know, even just seeing some of those logos down there with Dignity and Honor and Mayo and Phoenix Children's and so forth, the collaboration that takes place in this market among our partners um, has just been incredible. So, you know, those are the types of things that we like to look at. If you uh, recall TGIN and Honor Health working together on the first, you know, plasma approved program by the FDA probably a year ago was at the onset of the pandemic. You know, we're a first mover market in so many ways. And so I think we're going to see these numbers continue to grow over the next decade easily. Next slide. So this is a little interesting just to see, again, kind of the trajectory that we're seeing. Uh, and it really starts in the last decade in terms of what we've been noting as far as seed funding, uh, you know, companies and startups that have been doing the fundraising, it's been happening forever in this market, but you can see where it's really taken shape and those uh, represent the number of companies that have received funding. And obviously we can't always have a crystal ball to know how many of them will still be able to make their goals and, you know, thrive the way that Uncle Mix has, for example. Uh, but this is just a quick snapshot on some of the growth that you're seeing in funding as well. So, you know, the last thing I, I'll say before I pass it on is that one of the things that we're most excited about uh, is the collective growth, the partnership, the energy, the momentum in this market. And I think we're going to continue to be able to focus on topics such as population health and risk capital and, you know, the labor landscape. And so if any of you are working with companies who want to have a conversation about how they can be successful in a greater Phoenix market, you know, we have so many points of pride here with 
Park Central and Creighton University and, you know, certainly everything happening with the Phoenix Biomedical Campus. I think Dave's on this call. would love to hear him talk about it uh, and, and everything else that we've got going on. So for what we're seeing as far as prospect growth and the companies that we're attracting, this is kind of broken down a couple of different ways. You're going to see operation type and then you're going to see GPEC core healthcare prospects, and then a G GPEC adjacent prospect. So I've been seeing a really two kind of on the spectrum, two separate ends of uh, activity and growth. One is, you know, we're going to see some of those biomedical biotech companies specifically looking at this market to try to find a place uh, and assets like Wexford, uh, that science and technology location, but they might not need a ton of space. You know, maybe they need 3,000, 5,000, you know, a, a great one would be up to 10,000 uh, square feet of space that's in a lab in an lab enabled setting. So we're seeing some of those things. But we're also seeing companies that need 150 to 250,000 square feet, you know, for PPE manufacturing or med device manufacturing. And so when you see core, what that means is these are companies that are directly related to the healthcare life sciences, bioscience, uh, either by name or by function. But if it's adjacent, maybe what we're finding is it's actually a transportation and logistics company or a warehousing company, but it's specifically serving life sciences. So we are able to kind of narrow in on the data, again, being very data centric here at GPEC, um, really taking a look at the data to, to show the story of what the market is made up at this point. So, you know, obviously we're always gonna see some, you know, advanced, advanced administrative back, back office presence, um, you know, which we have kind of renamed a nerve center now. And that's what we like to do is try to draw attention to companies that can come here and put more than one function. They can add multiple business uh, functions to, to keep their operations going. But we're also seeing a ton on the manufacturing side. A lot of that was um, obviously inspired by the pandemic and some of the PPE requirements. Um, we were proud of Honeywell when they were given the co government contract, for example, to produce the uh, 95 masks uh, out of Arizona. Uh, but just wanted to break down quickly for you what these charts kind of mean. Okay, next. So as far as what are we doing, what's GPEC doing? This is a tiny example of something that we started actually last June. So coming up on a year, and I can tell you how this effort has grown uh, since we started it, piloted an industry-specific email automation campaign and essentially went up to, you know, the PAC Northwest, Seattle, Bay Area, down to LA Basin, and then San Diego, and basically targeted every biomedical company with two or more employees up to, you know, how, however big uh, we could get them in our pipeline. So you can see how many emails we delivered. And this was in, gosh, I want to say like a 30 day period. Okay. So almost 9,000 emails in 30 days uh, to 2,500 different contacts and almost 1,200 companies. And you're going to say, wow, that's a wide reach to get one prospect. Yeah, it does take that sometimes. It takes casting a very wide net um, to generate a lead. But this effort has evolved and come so far just in the last nine months that now uh, through this same type of uh, email automation campaign where we've targeted certain, you know, done geo-targeting, targeted certain companies, certain company contacts, mostly C-suite, we've sent out over 50,000 emails to company contacts trying to uh, put Greater Phoenix on the map. Most of this has been a result of the fact that we were road warriors before the pandemic set in. I was constantly flying to other markets and trying to get the word out and meeting with companies and brokers at other firms, national firms and so forth. I would have never been able to reach 50,000 people by myself in a year. So we have been able to put the power of, you know, data science and marketing automation behind us um, to do a lot of really good work. And at this point, I would say that what we're seeing in terms of prospect activity is probably 10x what you're seeing here, uh, which is incredible. Right now we're managing as a team of six at B on the BD team, 
over 304 active prospects. And so, you know, this has generated a ton of uh, lead activity for us. And so those are some of the things that we're doing as we pair marketing strategy uh, and data together to try to reach a wider audience and bring people to the region. Next slide. Well, there we are. So that's everything. I'm happy to answer any questions there are. I appreciate everybody on this call and certainly those of you that have been great partners to GPEC and uh, looking forward to seeing what the next decade will bring. Yeah, well, that's fantastic. And, you know, when you do your, your um, email reach out, are those, do you have different messages for oh, yes. different, different sectors of the, you know, like a biotech versus the manufacturer? I mean, yep. that's, that's the challenge of life sciences. It's so broad. So how do you, yes. how do you, um, how do you customize that and what kinds of message differences are there um, as the sector as you're reaching out? What sure, that's a great question. So, you know, I would say the life sciences, which was really a pilot, um, we tested a lot of different messaging and we have so many talented people at GPEC and we've got this, you know, really we call it a scrum team. And, you know, there's probably eight of us who work collectively on messaging. We've tested everything from time of day, day of week, which words uh, have a greater impact. We can see who clicks on what how many times, and that tells us what's grabbing the attention of our readers, uh, absolutely customizing the message. And I can share with you that we have incorporated in our campaigns, AZ Bio, Wexford, Phoenix Biomedical Campus, you know, some of our larger partners, Mayo, Tegen, the MedTech Accelerator. So, you know, to your point, there are so many different ways to categorize what's happening in life sciences. The, the recent campaign that I talked about with over 50,000 emails, that's a manufacturing target. So manufacturing companies, for example, in the LA basin, but many of those are manufacturing med device and medical equipment. So I've been able to you know, hear from a lot of different companies making masks, making gloves, making surgical equipment. Um, you know, that are interested in, in expanding to the region. So we hyperlink a lot of data uh, to these email messages and every single one, so one contact would be on schedule to receive five different messages, usually over the course of about six weeks or so, six to eight weeks. So within that time frame, every message is going to be different. Sometimes we're focusing on, you know, the cost, operating cost comparisons. We're focusing on what makes us competitive um, in terms of labor uh, and talent, in terms of education output, you know, anchors with major partners, and uh, usually just, a, you know, a way to tell them they can call us basically on anything. So starting off with the fact that we're a 501c3 nonprofit is also helpful because everything we do is complementary. And so people trying to save on costs don't want to spend money in every case, um, you know, up front to try to figure out what the best move would be. So we include all of that in the messaging. Yeah, and I think that, you know, you're doing a lot of advertising in that too. So you can't, you don't capture the full value just by, you know, the, the, the click through and the cost, who turns into a prospect. I right. think back to, you know, I did a, I finished, I started my, industry, my career in 99. I did a two year penance in the Bay Area um, and while I was there, I remember mean, this was like 99 to 2002, a bunch of ads kind of saying, hey, you could be working in San Diego instead of, you know, what you're experiencing right now. And in the, it, that, at that time, it was a pretty, it was a lot of reasons not to be in the Bay Area. So that like lodged in my brain, you know, I, I didn't respond right away, but after five, six, seven, you know, you see that multiple times, you start thinking, hmm, you know, I don't necessarily have to have this constrained lifestyle I have in the Bay Area with the system super high cost, you know, to wage, you know, ratio as, as a young scientist, I kind of live that. And, but it took multiple times hearing that, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, personally, I had family in Phoenix, so San Diego was closer to Phoenix. And, you know, you, you hear that, so, so the message has to be told multiple times before you actually say, you know, maybe I will think about making a move. And, and San Diego at that time did a really good job, but I think it just, um, I don't know, the advertising campaign, but it's definitely a very deliberate push to attract companies from the Bay Area down to San Diego. And I was one of those that then moved to you know, San Diego for seven years before coming here uh, nine years ago. So I, I just think I wouldn't underestimate how valuable just the, the overall reminding people on those clips and advertising function is, uh, not, not just the specific, you know, click through and conversion rates. 
So. Right. Well, and San Diego is a great town, um, you know, and sometimes we're competing with, you know, some other really terrific markets. So the last thing that I can tell you is that we've um, started a massive uh, effort on AZ free to be and essentially, you know, the lifestyle and livability component. That's incredibly important to people, especially if they're considering a full relocation, picking up from San Diego, leaving that market completely and then, you know, setting up shop here, that's a whole new lifestyle for them to consider. So uh, as a matter of fact, after this call today, I've got uh, a prospect in town from California who I'm going to be touring around the market and sharing, you know, with him about what are some of the great reasons to live here. Because at the end of the day, that's what people are concerned about, not only the health of their business, but the health of their families, and, you know, feeling successful in a place. So we do a lot of place-based um, you know, marketing and take a targeted approach that way, but lifestyle and livabil uh, livability is at the top. Yeah, I, I remind people that it's it's shorter to get on a plane in San Diego, 50 minute flight here, and then 10 minutes to my office. That's, that's an hour um, versus that's shorter than a lot of people commute just within San Diego and certainly within the the, the Bay Area type commute. So I, I remind people that all the time. Um, that's great, um, David. Maybe over to you. I'd love to hear your thoughts on on this. Um, Yes, thanks, Steve. Great job, Cameron. Um, it's always uh, either really a good thing to follow GPEC or a really bad thing to follow <laughs> GPEC. So um, take, uh, in the interest of time, um, I'll give you a little bit of background on us, but just think of, uh, think of Sun Corridor as kind of GPEC in miniature. Um, and we don't have the necessarily the numbers, but um, we have very similar functions and very similar work and have worked closely with them through the year. I've known Chris since he was uh, in the Yuma area and uh, I consider him one of my friends. So we enjoy working with them. We're a little bit of a unique model for us in that we are 75% privately funded and led. I have a very large board of 60 to 70 people um, at any given time. And most of those are from the private sector, so it's a little bit, a little bit different um, model. We do have the participation of some of the of the municipalities that are in our four county region down here, um, but it is privately driven and privately funded. So that that offers us some uh, ability to focus on some things and to um, and to be a little less political. And I don't mean to to say in the reverse that GPEC is, but what I mean is across the country, these types of groups tend to be more publicly based, publicly funded, and so we're a little bit different model there. Established in 2005, probably have 70% of all the employment south of Gila Bend uh, represented on my board in some way or another. Um, and we do the types of services that, that Cameron talked about, so I won't, I won't go into a lot of that. Next slide, Joan. I would like to allow for some time at the end here because Joan had sent a note about some things that we were doing specifically for bioscience. And I, I wanna mention a couple of those at the end, but um, I, I would be remiss not to point out again, just think of us in miniature. So all those numbers that Cameron had, you know, we've got a slice of that pie down here. It's a very important market for us. When we did our strategic uh, plan back in 2007, we emerged with four targeted industries that we think we have a competitive advantage in. And bioscience especially uh, is one of those. Um, and it's very important for its, um, both its presence uh, in, in our market um, and, and also the wages that it pays. And then of course you end up with a multiplication factor out as an economic impact, uh, as an impact uh, across the region is really outsized given, given those wages and the capex that go into uh, landing and, and maintaining these firms. But our strength here is really based at, 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 in, our, in our connection with the U of A. Um, several of our firms that uh, have emerged and are on the landscape, you can go to the next one, Joan, I think is, is my, my, logo, uh, my logo slide. And so up on the right left-hand corner, of course, you see Roche, well, that's a firm that used to be called Ventana. Um, they're upwards of, and they dominate the scene for us, which, which tends to impact the slice of bioscience that we have a strength in down here, which is diagnostics. And they, not to say that we're not represented by those other uh, logos that you see there and the other companies, we're very excited about those, but Roche is the, the big gorilla uh, as it comes to this. 
Um, we don't have quite the dominance of bioscience in this. Um, with Raytheon in our mix, we are very much an aerospace and defense dominated uh, uh, region. But bioscience is very important to us, again, for those reasons that I, that I mentioned. And, um, and it's something that we focus a lot of attention on. Um, it's also experienced a great deal of growth. I, I enjoyed reading the peer report that Joan sent over and actually learned a lot as I was sending her slides to, uh, sending her my slides, um, I was catching up on the peer report and realized that you probably don't need uh, me to recite to you the growth. Go ahead to the next slide, Joan, um, on how exciting this is and, and what, uh, um, what's going on in this industry. And I'll talk about the growth a little bit in a, in, the, in a minute. But our basis, without the resources of a larger organization, we really focus our efforts when it comes to recruitment and retention of or, uh, retru recruitment and relocation of firms like this. A lot of our attention has been focused on the site selection community and which of the which slice of that site selection community is focused on biosciences. So we do a tremendous amount of outreach. We've developed relationships over our 15 year history of focusing on those folks because they are the ones that are in the room often with these firms when these decisions are getting made. And so we uh, focus a great deal of our attention and resources on that because we have to be very targeted. We don't have uh, uh, the budget of a much larger or larger organization. So we have to be very targeted on this and we have to rely on our partners that you see on the screen here uh, for connections to, to the industry so that we're focusing our attention on those that um, are, are the best targets, the most the short-term targets for this. Uh, as opposed to GPEC, you know, I've got anywhere from 60 to 90 projects in my pipe, pipeline uh, for our three folks that are in BD um, at any given time. And, um, and, and then a slice of those, probably about 25% of those are, are in the bioscience uh, uh, sector generally. So um, very important to us. And, and we rely on these partners uh, to do that. Um, and we've seen tremendous growth uh, in uh, in this sector, uh, which is exciting for us. And then the pandemic happened. And uh, going to the next one, Joan. I think it talks about growth. So we had to come up with some new, you know, some new ways of in, uh, engaging with this with this uh, industry as, it, as everybody did last year. Um, what you see here are some of the assets that we have that we've used in our toolkit. Um, Flynn has been a very important partner for us. That bioscience roadmap that they put out um, is uh, essential for us to know what's going on in the industry. But again, the U of A, Bio5 specifically within the U of A, critical path. Um, and then in a, a state level, we have kind of our typical tools, the R&D tax credit, which you all are familiar with, given that I read the, you know, what was in the peer report there, the funding that comes through those universities. Um, but we also have some local things that we've done. And, and one of the things that uh, Joan asked to, to talk about was the assistance that we've provided for relocation employees and trailing spouses. One of the things we instituted um, a few years ago when we were attracting Caterpillar here was uh, a program that we call the Soft Landing Program, which allowed us to take advantage of our, our very large network of, of board members that are in the private sector and across all sectors. And when we would have a relocate come in or a, a recruitment come in, this, this trailing spouse and these employees that are come in, and as Cameron mentioned, um, you know, they're looking for what are the education opportunities for their kids? What are the healthcare opportunities? Who's going to be my doctor? Where am I going to live? Where am I going to do my banking? And we realized that on our board, we had a built-in network of, of folks that, had, that could be great ambassadors for our region. And we needed to engage them with these firms that were being relocated in um, so that they could help soft land them, um, help find trailing, uh, jobs for trailing spouses through our network of, of the board. So we've instituted this program on a number of, of projects. Now, you know, Caterpillar was a very large project for us and it was a very formalized program. Often this is a less formal program where we do introductions to these folks so that they can get those uh, get answers to those questions that I just laid out. But it's been, it's been important for us 
um, to to engage that board in not just a fiduciary role, if you will, with our organization, but to get them involved in the actual mission of, of what we're doing. And that's where our partnership, you know, the partnership with them and their, their support uh, pays off for us and also for these firms that we have uh, being, being re- relocated in. I will tell you that one of the recent success stories we've had in bio is kind of unique in this past year as we were able to land a, a company called Sandvik um, to do an operation here. It was a small, fairly small project. I think it was 40 or 50 employees eventually. The unique thing about that project though, during the pandemic is that we were able to do it completely virtually. That person, the, 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 the guy that was looking at prospective sites never came to Tucson. He, he visited, we did a virtual tour of the different facilities. We did our connections with our workforce folks and our, our incentive folks and our municipalities all by meetings like this with Zoom. And it got clear to the signing of the lease without a visit, which if somebody had told me two, a year and a half ago that you could do a project completely virtually, I'd have called them crazy. Um, but it's amazing how, adap- how adaptable you can be. And one of those success, and that success just happened to fall into the bioscience realm. So that was a really exciting for us. Um, and uh, hopefully I won't have to keep doing those. I would like to get back to where uh, Cameron says we're road warriors because uh, we've been, our team is out there as well. And this is the name of this game. Uh, oftentimes is to get out there and see people. One of the other things that we do to engage um, our board, um, and, and our network of team is to lead, specifically to lead best practices trips, um, not necessarily focused just on bio, although we did do a trip to San Diego a number of years ago that, that had a, a, a big piece of that uh, related to bio. But to engage again, our leadership with that site selection community in a very direct way, we'll land in a market, we'll focus on meetings with site selectors and take our leadership into those meetings so that they can sell Southern Arizona. They tend to do even better job than we do uh, because they're living it. And they can talk about their, uh, their labor situations, their, what it's like to do, to do business in the community vis-a-vis the governments that are there. So we will t- lead these business trips or these leadership trips out into communities of site selectors and take 40 or 50 of our folks uh, in tow um, and have them sell the region. That's been very effective for us to spread the word um, in addition to things like um, in addition to things like the, the email campaigns, which we have a site selector newsletter. We have, uh, you know, virtual, not virtual, but we have uh, email campaigns where we send out with where we're trying to connect with those folks, but we find the connections with those with that site selector community to be to be very effective. Um, so uh, with that, I I wanted I liked your structure, Joan, in that I wanted to be able to take some questions, and um, I know that we're uh, at, at about ten minutes, and I, I could go on and on about some of the other things we're doing. But maybe I'll stop there. Go to the next slide. I think that's my my end slide there. Um, yeah. And I would like to engage a little bit because it's important for us to hear from you all. I did look through that peer report, but I'm, I'm always curious as to what uh, you folks are living it. You were either, you were either the target of supper, such an effort like Cameron and, or ours um, and are here for that effort or you were homegrown. Oftentimes with this sector, with us, they were homegrown because they, they were spin outs from the U of A or from a tech transfer effort but we have had our share of relocates come in. So I'm always interested to hear what would, what, what you see as an issue for what we need to focus on to be effective here, because the sectors are also different. You know, we're, we're engaged in aerospace and transportation and logistics in, in, um, in natural resources, the mining section is very important. To us. And they've all got these little nuances that we do slightly different things to get in front of the right people to, to be effective here and bio, has its own little nuances. So I'll stop there, Steve, and, um, and take any, any questions rather than, uh, rather than taking up all our time before eight o'clock or nine o'clock. Well, let it, thank you so much, Dave, this is great. Um, let's speak a little bit about specifically attracting talent. And I mean, talent, I mean, people that are, that are, that are industry movers, those are people with five to 20 years of experience in their bioscience sector. 
And I'll maybe I'll frame this from my own experience right now. So we we have been very successful with with getting um, undergrads right out of ASU um, and then PhDs right out of ASU and then training. And of course, we have a hub where we're making viruses. So that kind of is a is a lab that is doing it here. So we've done a really good job of that. The next stage is really how do we get um, people with ten to, to five to ten years of experience to come in and be their managers, be their directors, uh, be their vice presidents. And that's hard. And um, hard. We've, we've engaged it. And, and I will say also, we're working in, in biotech, which is, you know, the third pillar. I think we've done, we have, the, we have a, you know, we should be very, very, very proud of what we've done in medical devices and in diagnostics in this state. I mean, you have a lot of companies you can point to um, in, in both in Tucson and in Phoenix and a little bit up in Tag yes. as well. So in diagnostics and in um, devices, I mean, you've got Bohr, you've got, I mean, there's, there's a lot. Um, in, in biotech, it's hard. I don't have as many companies I can point to. So that that does, you know, I am kind of, I think, starting a little more from um, from scratch. But my experience has been, so I've, like, just example, last week, um, I brought in a, you know, a senior director candidate. We had a, a consulting firm. We looked at about 100, 100 people and narrowed it down to about three or four that would, would be willing to, yes, I, I will relocate to Phoenix. Yeah. And these are people typically from Boston, New Jersey, um, San Francisco, uh, it's tough to get people from out of San Diego, um, although when they realize it's pretty easy to, to do work in Phoenix, um, it, 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 the barriers are lower. But, you know, um, so we brought someone in last week. Um, we, he, he has a trailing spouse. He's an artist. Um, we were very deliberate in terms. We actually brought him out for three or four days. So they really got a feel for Phoenix. Fortunately, they had great weather, um, which was good. But they spent a day up in Sedona. And, and, and they honestly kept, you know, they couldn't even pronounce Sedona. They were like, so, Sedona, what is that? So it just gives you, we forget what we have here. And so we, of course, say, well, yeah, you've got Sedona, but from someone, they're from New Jersey, you know, and they've never really been been in the Southwest that much. So they were just shocked by how cool Sedona was. But I can't tell them that on the phone. Um, we hooked them up with a realtor. So, and, and there too, I mean, you can tell people you can get a, you know, a $400,000, $500,000 home and be 20 minutes from work. But until they actually see it with a realtor and they're like, wow, it, this is really true. I could sell my house in, in, in San Francisco and buy a cul de sac in Phoenix. Um, it, it, just, it takes a while to sink in. Um, I have a friend in Utah um, who's, who's kind of similar problem at recursion. And, and he says, you know, if he can get people on the plane, then he has them hooked. But if he can't get them on the plane in, into Utah seeing and actually experiencing what life will be like, um, he never gets in here. So if you can get it, and, and, and the same thing we're doing. So you kind of have that three day, you've got to have a really good um, story for the whole family. Uh, but Claudia has done a really nice job in mayor's office of a map of all the schools. Um, that's important too. I do find, you know, these, they really struggle with understanding geography, like, you know, where in Phoenix should I live? Um, where are the good schools? You know, where, how far? Is it in Mexico? Yeah. <laughs> So I just think we forget what, what, what we know that they don't know. So anyway, that's been my experience. I'm pretty hopeful I'll, I'll, I'll get to scan it. We've got a couple of different senior director candidates, but it has been, I mean, we had a funnel and, you know, to, in terms of the sales job, we had a funnel of a hundred, narrowed it down to a handful that really wanted to be in Phoenix. Um, and I think for all the industries like this, I mean, I mean, companies are built, you know, yes, there's entrepreneurs, but they're built by people that have the five to 20 years of experience in that industry. That's and right. getting those people here is, is critical. Steve, I find that we have to, and maybe this is a little less so in Phoenix, but, but for us, we have to overcome a perception that's out there. So I like the analogy to the Utah folks. If I can get them on the plane, if I can get them here for a few days, there is a perception that is in people's minds that's built up over time for whatever community it is. And Tucson has its own and Phoenix has its. And, and we've We've done several perception studies with site selectors so that we do we get out of our own bubble and we go talk to the people that are looking at us from the outside in so that we can address what that is. Um, when I competed with uh, for to land accelerate here with Larry Marin, I was in I was in competition with Boulder. Well, I, I went to school in Boulder, you know, back in you know uh, whatever, and I thought there's no way I can compete with Boulder, but. We did quite well with that group that had about 10 years experience, but we had to get them here and they had to hear from some people that live here. Uh, they mm -hmm. couldn't, I was the sales guy. My team was the sales people. We're going to tell them whatever we can tell them to get them here. But that network of I, that I had and that Cameron talked about, you know, amongst her community, that's where that comes into play. They have to sit over dinner 
They have to have drinks and people have to look across and say, dude, I get on my bike every afternoon from here to here and don't even think about work. And don't read, don't believe what you read about the schools. I found a great school in blah, blah, blah. And it happens with that, that connection. And so we work hard on that because we do tend to have a perception out there that it's a retirement community, that it's dusty, that it's hot. And if I can get them out here and show them what it's like uh, nine months of the year and what their life's going to be like when they're not in the lab, I tend to do, we tend to do very well. So Accelerate brought 10 people here, oh, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago. And we are at 150 out there now. And that doesn't happen just because you have a low tax rate or just because you have a great building. It happens because they build a community amongst themselves. Word gets out that this is a good place to live for somebody like that. And, and then you can attract, because it's all talent. You're, you're, you're spot on. It, it, it really comes down to that both the base of talent that you have here that you can build those companies with and how can you attract, attract more. And, you know, when you're competing with places like Denver that have a 50% college, you know, bachelor's attainment rate in the workforce, you've got to work twice as hard when we have the, the bachelor's attainment rate that we have here to, to escalate that so that we can be even in the realm of competition. Now, Phoenix is a first tier market they're competing for, you guys are competing for top notch. You're, you're competing with the Bostons. In my world, I'm competing with the Boulders, with the Salt Lakes, yeah. with, um, with the Portlands. Um, and, but it's the same game. It doesn't matter who you're competing with. You still have to go in and you still have to convince those because these firms are based with those people. And you still have to convince those people that their life, they, they, they got the job. They like the job. They know what they're doing. It happens to me with Raytheon all the time. You know, they're excited to work for Raytheon. Where's my kid going to go to school? How's my doctor service going? What am I going to be doing when I'm not making missiles? And right. that's, and, and if we can compete better there, and I think we've done a better job. We have a long way to go, but I think we've done a better job of putting our best foot, a better foot forward there. So. Yeah, and they're tied together because, you know, like the title of this, this, um, this hour is attracting companies and talent you know, to Phoenix. And I like I want to I want to allocate some of our IPO funds, you know, in a year or so from now towards manufacturing. I want to have a GMP facility here in Phoenix. The, the question I get you know, immediately from all the VCs is, well, are you really going to have enough GMP talent to do that? Right. In That's pharma right. and biotech, and it's like, exactly you know, right. well, can, you, can you bring them here? So they're, they're, they're intimately tied. I mean, you, you've got to be able to get these these mid-career professionals here. And, and I think you're right. They have to smell it. They have to taste it. They, they can't just hear about it. And once they get here, you know, and, and they, you got nine months of good weather here, you've got three weeks of good weather in New Jersey and Boston. I mean, right. you know, there's no difference. So, well, and um, I lead with Phoenix all the time. I say, I may not have them, but, but 75 minutes up the road, I can get them. I can get all you need to move down here. Now I don't tell Cameron this all the time, but I do tell them that I got access to a market that'll, and pretty, you know, in 10 years, there's not going to be much difference between us anyway. It'll be, you know, we'll, we're just going to eat up Pinal County and it'll be like Boulder, Boulder, Denver. It'll be one big uh, corridor. Here's a question. It says for David, but Cameron, also feel free to chime in. Are U of A, ASU and PCC large enough to produce the required skilled workers for bio industry in Arizona? Um, considering that Phoenix is the sixth largest city in the country, the ratio of skilled workers coming out of the industry is to do what is needed is not so proportional. What are the strategies to attract talent to live in Phoenix? Well, the latter half of the question, I think we, we addressed a little bit. So I'll leave that one. The, the first half, I can always use more. I, I, we, we absorb as much as we possibly can out of those institutions. And they're the basis for our strength in this. But as you led, Steve, we, we do pretty well with the ones that are right out of school, you get the ones that haven't had, they're not as valuable to the industry because they haven't done anything yet. And the companies are going in and basically giving them, you know, continuing training after they've had their formal training. So we, we do fine there. I, I, I would always like to see that capacity increase. I'd like to see our bachelor's attainment rate across the labor sector increase so that our, our, the quality of our entire talent pool increases across all sectors, it does, not just bio. But you hit it on the head. It's, it's after they've gone away, become valuable to the industry, actually are leaders in the industry. How do we get them to come back? If they came from here, I have a leg up. 
They, they have a fond place in their memory for their time in Tempe. They have a fond place in their memory for, for Tucson. And so if they have a connection there, that's easier. It's when they went to school at, you know, in the Bay Area or they went to school in Boston and they have no connection to it. Yeah, no family. You know. And when, and when we were recruiting Caterpillar out here, you, you can't imagine. I mean, they, they were in the employee base at Caterpillar. They were routing around pictures of tarantulas and they were saying, have you seen how big the spiders grow out there? And so you had to overcome some of this stuff where it's like, you know, they're, 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 they're not walking down the street They're you know, and, and you can get on your bike. So Cameron. Yeah. I, you know, if I were to jump in on that, I would say it's so funny. First of all, like we have to say, yes, there are scorpions and snakes here, but that's not all we promise. (laughs) Um, But I really, you know, kind of going back to that cross sector collaboration, I put a couple of notes in the chat just, you know, on this, which is, you know, that the the growing healthcare needs of the region really are met by the alignment of our local universities and our bioscience companies and, you know, all those biomedical firms uh, and the care providers. So, you know, when we think about what's coming out of the ground and the talent that's going to be produced, you know, I'm, I'm understanding there are two things. One is, how do you attract mature talent with up to 20 years of experience? Yes, probably, you know, in the short term, we're going to have to do some, you know, external candidate searches. But I think what we can see on the horizon here is that because we have such a strong ecosystem of, you know, providers, you know, biomedical firms and and education clusters, is that we're going to see the talent coming out of the ground in these specific areas more than we've seen before. ASU Biodesign obviously is very active in that. Um, the UA Health Sciences and Medical School, all of their partnerships. You know, I think the question was, is, is, is the presence large enough? And ASU has almost 120,000 students, uh, including online and on ground. Obviously, all of those are not in the sciences, but the STEM degree programs yes. you know, make up the largest anchor of majors across that spectrum. We also have the Maricopa Community Colleges, the largest community college network in the nation, 10 colleges, two skill centers. You know, they have all of these different labs working to try to produce new talent. CEI is a great example of that out of Mesa Gateway. Uh, They have a presence at the Wexford uh, for their validation program and job creation program. So, you know, I really think that we're going to see people ramping up programs in terms of education and collaboration even more than we have now. Um, have you thought about more advertising, Cameron, to, through LinkedIn? Um, because I, I'm surprised how many of the candidates that express interest, have, actually how many people I run through that have done an undergrad at ASU or U of A, and then they're, they're in the Bay Area, they're in New Jersey and Boston. And you could certainly target those people on LinkedIn type of a, you know, reconsider Phoenix or come back home or, you know, it's something along those lines, and it could be industry specific. Oh, LinkedIn has become very, very important to us. Very important. I've had to have a whole education on this that are people are younger than me because I'm like, really? Um, but it, it, our communications folks, we've put a tremendous amount of effort into LinkedIn, both on the site selector side and the direct company side, just talent and getting our message out. It is a, it is a really important tool. It's the only social media I, I, that I really use actively. So. Yeah. yeah, super important. So I think, you know, at this point, I want to um, really thank Steve for leading a great discussion. And I know that he has an important meeting coming up. So um, I wanted to make sure I got that in and um, I'll be kind of joining into the discussion thank for you. our last few minutes. But Steve, great job. Thanks, well, you guys, thank you so much. I mean, it's such a multi-pronged thing. And I just say anything we do works, you know, you, you know, like what Cameron's, what she's doing and it's our part advertising, part awareness. And I just, you know, I think we just have to all keep at it. And, uh, but there are so many success stories. I mean, my company started because of collaboration out of, out of um, Mayo Clinic, Mayo Clinic samples, collaboration with a- ASU. I mean, we use TD2, which is, which is a world-class, um, um, CRO over in Scottsdale, you know, they, they have dozens of employees over there. They do fantastic work. Um, imaging and it's just, there's a lot of companies here that I think we have to just keep, keep reminding people of what we're doing and keep telling the story. So anything we do, 
Um, I think it matters, and we have a great product here. This is a this is a really great place to live. It's a great city. It's easy to get in and out of, and and it's a no brainer for you know, for relocating really good talent to this to this town. So thank you all for this. And I'm sorry I do have to jump. I've got a venture capital raise in, in four minutes, so I to jump off. Get the money. But you yeah, guys keep doing. Go it. get them. Go get, get that money. money. <laughs> thank you, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Okay, so um, to, to continue the discussion, um, you know, Claudia Whitehat, who, who's joining us um, on the call today, you know, is a great example of how we can reach out and attract both companies and talent. And that is with the City of Phoenix's active support um, and engagement at the Bio International Convention, which is coming up in June. And so, you know, that's an example where our bioscience companies this year in a virtual environment um, and our economic development teams and our researchers and our universities are all, you know, actively working to tell the story of what's happening in Arizona. And, you know, that's very, very important. What are some of the other ways, David and Cameron, that our companies can help tell the story for you. Um, you know, examples of, you know, the Flynn Foundation, AZ Bio, um, trade shows. How can we help you be more successful in helping us? Mm, I love that. That's a definitely a, <laughs> a circle, um, the, the perfect circle. I, you know, I think it's going to be that multiplier effect. So when I know what you do to connect scale up companies with investors and, you know, Flynn and all of their work, we work so closely together. I understand what the targets and missions are on your side. So when I'm working with companies and sometimes they're out of market, we've got 25% of our prospects are international right now. We've got a lot of, you know, biotech leads, uh, bioscience leads out of the UK, for example, and they need to partner in the market. They need to test, validate their product in order to move here and scale. And so I think some of those initial introductions could be leveraging our partnerships better so that then you've got now a company that you can work with, right, to, you know, kind of turn up your services. So I see it as, you know, making an initial connection, helping each other that way in terms of marrying our services together just to try to get you know, more companies feeling like they have the support to scale in our market. So usually it's, you know, it's not an overly complicated approach. Uh, usually it's just making the connection, which is something that we, you know, pride ourselves on trying to do because we have over 180 private investors, the 22 cities and towns in Maricopa County. So all of the people who make up GPEC and the success of GPEC are top of mind for us, you know, as I'm sure it is for David too, you know, and all of his partners. So, you know, leveraging AZ Bio, Flynn, it just starts with a warm intro. David? Joan, I also think that I mentioned it earlier, but I, I, I think we have been impressed with, I, I know for us, I won't speak for Phoenix, but for us, it is somewhat an overcoming of a perception. I don't think it's reality on the ground. I think that's particularly true with our education system, which we, you know, it, it, we don't lead well with that. And, and I'm not here to say that there aren't challenges with our education system, there are. But I think that we need to, especially on social media, we can all be putting out into the ether, the positive things that we're saying. And I think sometimes we, especially the old guy saying this, I, I, I worked a long time trying to keep my dome closed and my kids, all, all my children do, my grown boys, is they just try to open the door. They're, they're trying to tell the whole world about what they're doing for breakfast. And it's a, it's a, it's a demographic shift for me, but it is a very pow a powerful tool. And, and, and to overcome some of that perception that we have out here that we are a retirement community, that we are, that it is uh, a, what it was 25 years ago. Uh, it's not that anymore. And we have a powerful tool at our disposal, including those networks that Cameron talked about. But also the social media lets us get on a platform. We can all do our part to be sending out those messages that this is a vibrant business center and not just a place to escape the snow. Um, it's not just a place to come in February when it's miserable everywhere else. It's a place where you can have a career 
where there's exciting innovation happening, where there's a good, a good base of firms. And, and the more we send that message out there, then the more that it, it lays the groundwork for us to not have to educate everybody that we're talking to. And hopefully, um, you know, thanks to the amazing work of our healthcare workers and our researchers uh, and our innovators, Yes. who are delivering vaccines in Arizona is doing a pretty good job of getting those shots in arms now. Um, we hope that Arizona Bioscience Week, which is the first week in October, um, will be live and in person. And that will include um, the Discovering New Medicines in Arizona conference, which will be hosted by the University of Arizona up on the Phoenix Biomedical Campus. Um, as well as the, you know, AZ Bio events and Innovation Showcase and 850 on the PBC or otherwise known as the Wexford Building um, and a wide range of other activities. And I, so I think that's a great opportunity um, for all of us to work together. Flynn Foundation, GPEC, Sun Quarter, AZ Bio, the cities and towns to um, start to reach out to um, these people that we've been building relationships with virtually or maintaining relationships with virtually over the last year and say, hey, come out and see us in October. We, we have a seat for you at the table. So yeah. I think um, there are opportunities. And of course, the um, you know, this year we had 56 pages in AZ, AZ Business Magazine. Um, talking about the amazing stuff happening in Arizona's bioscience sector. Um, we plan to have that again um, and then use it throughout 20, the end of 21 and into 22 and in-person events around the country. So let's figure out how we can all work together. Um, and remember, we want to attract companies, but we also want to attract talent. So when you're having those conversations, when you're marketing in those um, marketplaces, we want to be talking about the growing businesses that are looking for talent, and it's a great place for people to move their families to and, and grow companies here. So with that, I want to thank David and Cameron for terrific presentations, um, and we will be, this has been recorded, so I will be editing um, the, the video and getting it up on the AC Bio Peers page, which you can always find under the resource tab at acbio.org, um, where all the peers videos live. And um, that way, when you need a refresher on those topics, you can find them. Again, a big thank you to Cameron, a big thank you to David. Um, let's go and get some more companies and some more talent to join the amazing ones we already have here and make Arizona a top tier bioscience state. We're, Thank we're, you we're so much, out. Joan. Thank you. This was an excellent, uh, excellent event. Thank you so much. I see Thanks, you, Joan. Everybody. Nice to meet you, Cameron. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.